George, welcome. Welcome to Silverstone. We know how good this crowd is, but just say it tonight. It's great to be here, isn't it? Wow, I didn't realize there's so many people here. Yes. <laughs> didn't know where to say to it. Thanks for coming out. Um, no, pleasure to be here and excited to uh, have a chat with you all this evening. Um, the first half of this show, we did our top 10 greatest ever drivers, which, as you can imagine, caused a fair bit of debate. Um, I'm going to ask you your top three to see if it matches ours. Obviously, Jolian is in the top three. <laughs> <laughs> Likewise, George. Yes, Likewise. George. I didn't even set him up. Sorry, Jolian. <laughs> I told you it was a weird omission that I wasn't in there earlier. Um, I think it's. I think one thing I'm I'm learning across sort of this journey in Formula One is it's so difficult to answer a question like this, and I think. Um, you've seen, let's say, for example, using Max and Lewis as an example, during the years that Lewis won for, for so many, Max was always there, you know, in P3, P4, couldn't quite challenge, and now, you know, the tables have turned a little bit, and Lewis and I are in this position that we can't quite challenge Max, and, you know, these are two exceptionally talented drivers, but there's so many talented drivers in Formula One, and you know, I look at Lando as an example, a you know, super talented driver, but you know, not quite getting the opportunity to, to fight where, where he deserves to be. So, um, I see give us an answer, I know, George. I see what you're saying, George, but stop, come stop on the now. politics. <laughs> give us an answer. Give us a top three. Is Lewis there? Yeah, of course he's there. Of course yeah. he's there. <laughs> no, I mean, you, you, you say the names that everybody would say, Lewis, Schumacher, Senna, but it's... Hey. Um, they were our top three. And we're three races in, uh, with three Red Bull wins down. But look, me, like Mercedes... <laughs> there are sort of this, like a few little Red Bull fans dotted about who are just getting, crouching down in their seats. I thought they might have been off at halfway, actually. Yeah, I'm, I'm amazed you've made it of... back, James, to be fair. How would you assess the season so far from your perspective and indeed the Mercedes perspective as a whole? I mean, it's not ideal, is it? <laughs> it's, um, it's definitely not ideal, but it's, I think in life, it's, things should never be too easy. And I think for all of us, you know, there's 2,000 strong people in Mercedes. We're on this journey together, challenging to overcome the, the problems we're facing, trying to understand them, working together as a team. And I think, for example, when we got that victory last year, the feeling was just so sweet for everybody, and I had my engineer, he was in tears of joy, you know, he's won tens and tens of races before, but it meant so much to everybody because everybody put so much hard work into it. We were slowly on the comeback, and I think that's what makes sport great. So I think, you know, we haven't started where we want to be, but I know with the team we've got around us, we will get there, and when we do, it's gonna be sweet. So, um, yeah, we'll keep on pushing. <laughs> You said in, in Bahrain, Red Bull are going to win every race this year. <laughs> <laughs> Let's dig out some old quotes. Are you sticking by it? Or are you going to get there? No, I think we'll get there. I think we'll get there. I mean, it's... Um, the difficulty is with, with the media, and, I mean, no offence either side <laughs> here now. I mean, obviously, we're being put in front of a cam camera directly after a race. It's the first thing we do. So much emotion, so much adrenaline. And you do say things that are slightly, you don't necessarily mean in the heat of the moment. But then it's, it is so frustrating sometimes as an ind individual when you see these headlines. They are being sort of twisted to make the story, to get the, the clicks and the, the reads. And, and it's why sometimes you feel like you do need to be diplomatic. And I think that's when you had Drive to Survive, people enjoyed it to a degree as drivers because there was no scrutiny there and then in the moment and you could feel like you could be yourself a little bit more and it's shown in a different dynamic. Whereas when you're in that TV pen after a race and you're being grilled, you know, why did you crash into science at turn one? Well, it wasn't, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't like I planned to crash into him. It, just, it happened, so... You, you touched upon your first win and how sweet it felt for you. So we'll just go back to that, the Brazilian Grand Prix last year. Did it also for you feel all the sweeter as well because the Sakir Grand Prix slipped through your fingers and that was a win that was within your grasp to an extent. And then it felt to me like the race win was a long time coming for you, George. 
Yeah, it was definitely a long time coming, but to be honest, that Sakia Grand Prix for me was history. It's not something I think about at all. And I think the sport we live and the life we live, you need to you know, learn from these disappointments, but move on and not let it dwell on you too much. Um, I think for me, you know, I've dreamt of that moment of winning a race my whole life and uh, being a world champion. I've got a photo down here. No, don't worry. That's coming up sorry, soon. Sorry, sorry. There's, there's an embarrassing photo <laughs> incoming amazing. that I can see, but you guys can't see. So <laughs> They've turned it off for you <laughs> now. It off now. It's an amazing um, photo. It's not a nude. Soon. Don't worry. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he has got his shirt on in this photo. <laughs> <laughs> That's to come later. <laughs> um, you promised it, not me. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I think something when I was younger, you know, dream of this this moment and even when I was in Formula One dream of this moment you always think you know how am I going to feel you know it's going to feel incredible when I cross the line and win the first race but I never really comprehended of how it's going to make everybody feel who's supported me and contributed towards the win all the team members my family my friends the people who have worked with me in the past to uh, give me the chance to reach Formula One and that probably resonated with me more than actually the feeling of crossing the line itself, just seeing how much it meant to everybody who had supported me on the way, on the way and that's probably why I was quite emotional uh, at that time. Should we bring up the photo then? Yeah. Um, bring up the photo. Uh, oh no, that's, that's no, just that George. <laughs> <laughs> this one, look, it's baby George. How old were you here? Um... <laughs> You've got a Lewis t-shirt on and everything. <laughs> He's more embarrassed of this photo than I am. <laughs> I think that was back in 2009, so I'd have been 11, oh, yeah, 11 years old. Bless you. Um, what is Lewis like as a teammate, first of all? Yeah, <laughs> he's fast. He's definitely fast. No, he's, he's a great teammate, to be honest. I think as, as an F1 driver, you know, you're, everybody always says your biggest rival is your teammate. But I think because we're at very different stages of our career, we've obviously got the, the natural competition between us, and of course we want to beat one another. But there's this element that we are working to together. We do want to push the team forward because we recognize that we need to have a good working relationship to, to keep the team morale high, to keep pushing the team in the right direction. And I think if the drivers start to fall out, the teams, uh, the engineers start to become divided, and then it creates a really unhappy environment. And ultimately, we as drivers are the ones who, who will lose out because we won't have the car to, to win for races. So, you know, we've got a good relationship. Things are good. He's keeping me on my toes. So I hope I'm keeping him on his toes as well. And um, hopefully we've got the car soon to, to win. Were you expecting when you... So you were first teammates with Lewis last year. Were you expecting to be as competitive with him as you were when you turned up in Mercedes? Uh, yeah. I, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, they no, no. That sounded a bit harsh. <laughs> But this is Lewis Hamilton. We ranked him as number one of, of, of drivers of all time. It's Mercedes' team that's been, you know, his thing for since 2013. You did a very good race in Sakir. But, like, were you, you, you thought you were going to go in and, and take it to him? Or were you thinking, just tread water and just try and learn a little bit from him straight away? I went in with an open mind, but I, I backed myself. And I think... You know, you put the hard work in and you, um, you push in the right ways and you, you build a good relationship with the team and you understand what the car needs. You know, if you've got, let's say, the speed, there's no reason why you can't beat anybody. And I think, I think Formula One, it's, you're obviously competing against everybody else, but you've got to kind of look, look at yourself in the mirror. Once that helmet's on, you're kind of racing against yourself. If I go out there and qualify and, and produce the best laps possible with the best car underneath me, you'll put it on pole. If you make the best start and you get into the lead and you just keep on banging out the laps, you'll win the race. So you shouldn't get too caught up on the fact that, you know, I'm in the same garage as Lewis Hamilton or racing against Max Verstappen. You know, I'm racing against myself to be as quick as possible. And if I do what I believe I'm capable of, I'll be able to win the races. Do you have a banter room in like a WhatsApp group? Like, ha, ah, I beat you this time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's a yes, is it? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. No. Yeah, maybe I should. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> no. um, George, we're seeing this photo. We've still got it down here on these return screens. What would you say to 11-year-old George standing next to, I guess, one of your 
motorsport heroes at that age, Lewis Hamilton now, what would you say to him about the position you're in today? Don't know, to be honest. Cut your hair, probably. <laughs> it's a pretty awful haircut. Um, no, I think along my journey, you know, naturally you make mistakes and you do things that you regret. And as a young kid, whether I was eight years old in go-karting or 16, 17, 18 in Formula 4, Formula 3, there's moments I wish that I did differently. In the time, you know, I would regret the day after. I can't believe I did this or I had this crash or said this thing. But sitting here now as an F1 driver at 25 years old, I wouldn't change a single thing that happened, good and for bad, in my whole career because that's kind of shaped me in the person who I am today and I feel like I've learned more from the times that I failed than the times when I, I succeeded. So... Um, What's the... So, um, yeah, not being afraid to fail, I guess. George, what's the hardest part about being a Formula One driver? Because obviously you, you probably enjoy most of it, but what's the hardest part of it? Uh, <laughs> I mean, I definitely can't complain. I think what I do is pretty, pretty damn cool, so... Um, Are you no, going to say media? <laughs> if you wasn't here, then maybe I would say media. But <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, that, that, is, that is a bit of a challenge, for sure, because it's... You know, I'm a racing driver. I'm not an actor. I'm not a public speaker. Um, you know, but you have to, as a Formula One driver, there's so many additional things that you have to do. The sponsor events, you know, dealing with the partners, because these are the guys who make this happen. You know, they, they bring the funds that allow the team to invest and make the car faster. So there's a lot of things you have to, to learn. I think the traveling is tough. And I think, you know, we'll know with traveling around the world, it's of course this glamorous lifestyle that we live. But when you you leave on a Sunday to go to Australia, you've got big time zone differences, the stress on the body is huge. You go to 23 different countries across the year, um, staying in 23 different hotels, different environments, different foods, you know, trying to get a healthy meal in China or Mexico is quite challenging, or even around Silverstone trying to get a good salad <laughs> is, uh, is, not, is not, not the easiest. And I think these are things that, not just for me as, as, a, as a driver, but for the three, four, five thousand strong people who travel around Formula One in every single department, it's challenging. Time away from family, friends, but we do it because this is what we love. What about the sim? Yeah. How do you put the sim? <laughs> I don't mind the sim, to be honest. It's, it's something I'm, I'm putting a lot more work into at the moment because I think as time evolves, you know, simulators will just be the go-to thing in 10 years' time every single racing driver is going to have a simulator, every single racing driver. The sim stuff is going to just be part of the, the natural course of, of Formula One driving. And I think I always try and think, you know, what is the next big thing going to be? In 10 years' time, what are the next generation going to be doing that we're not doing? And what can I do to be ahead of the curve? The same way as maybe the drivers of today are doing more than the drivers of 10 years ago and the same as those drivers then compared to the ones of the 90s, as, a, as an example. I used to hate the sim. <laughs> and I bet Lewis doesn't like the sim, does he? He doesn't love the sim, no. <laughs> the, older, the older drivers seem to like it less, probably because you've grown up a, a little bit more with, with, I guess, PlayStation or generally that world. I remember Michael Schumacher came back. He couldn't use the sim at Mercedes because it would make him dizzy and he, and he just wasn't up to speed with I it. I think it was just a hell of an excuse, to be honest, to get <laughs> yeah. out of doing, doing I can't imagine work. Kimmy did a lot either. <laughs> no, exactly. I mean, they've come a long, a long, long way now. I mean, it's, it's not the real thing, but you've got to put the time and, and effort into it and you, you only get out of it what you, what you put into it. So, um, yeah, there's a bigger picture and, you know, we have to contribute towards developing this because, you know, I know that the guys I'm racing against, Lando, Charles, Max, you know, they all want to win. And they're all going to be putting this work in. And, you know, we need to be doing the same, if not a lot more, to, uh, to get there. We're here at Silverstone. I think it's fair to talk, therefore, about what makes it so brilliant. Uh, and indeed, to look ahead to this year's British Grand Prix as well. Um, what is it you love about this track, George? What are your favourite memories of this place? Um, and equally, what are you thinking about in terms of the British Grand Prix? Well, I think for the British Grand Prix, this is always a driver's favourite because of, because of you guys, because there's so much enthusiasm <laughs> and support for, you know, all the British drivers, for sport as a whole, but always come into Silverstone. It's always a great event. 
I've got this really embarrassing video of my brother dancing to Craig David on Saturday night a couple of years ago. <laughs> um, and it's always just seems like a, a lot of fun, but as a driver, you know, the track is just, just awesome. They're so fast, so flowing. In these Formula One cars, it's just so, so quick. And for me, you know, growing up around Silverstone, having my first race in Silverstone, my first win in cars at Silverstone, just so many memories. Uh, first time I drove a Formula One car was at Silverstone as well. So, um, yeah, special place for me. You mentioned the track and, and how fast and flowy it is, but what is it like to drive and race on as well and battle? Because it seems to lend itself to brilliant racing each and every time. Yeah, it's definitely one of the best for racing. I think it's because these corners are quite wide, they're quite open, and it allows you to do different lines. And I think Formula One cars, it's so, so challenging to, to follow one another. When you get up close behind somebody, you got all of this dirty air and the car sort of washing out beneath you. It all goes a bit light and it's really difficult. But you know, around here, through Mangus and Beckett's, you can do different lines. Through turn three, turn four, you can do different lines. Good slipstream down the straight. Always blooming windy here in Silverstone, which makes it, makes it challenging. But it's, um, it's always a driver's favorite and it's, it's great. It's probably the best circuit for the driving experience, but also for the quality of the race. You know, we have some tracks like Monaco, which is obviously really fun to drive, but to race is, I mean, the race is just boring. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but this, this track here is, yeah, definitely probably the best, the best one for the two. What's the most difficult part of this circuit and what is either the most fun or the most simple? I wouldn't say easy. I don't think any part of a Formula One racetrack is necessarily easy. Yeah, I think, um, I mean, Cops is like such a high speed corner, but we're so, the cars are so fast now, that is almost easy flat out going through there at about 180 miles an hour. So massive G-force. But then Maggots and Beckett's is always so challenging. You need to, to carry that speed through the corners. And in these F1 cars, the faster you go, the more downforce you've got. So you just need to be so, so committed just to keeping that foot nailed and uh, don't lift it off until, you, until you're there. And the fans as well. Do you get a sense of the fans, of these guys out there screaming any part? I know it's pretty much visor down, <laughs> helmet on. Of course, of course. Noise of the engine. But where do you feel you get the best sense of that? I think definitely through the BRDC corner and through Luffield, you know, you've got, you go down that, what was the straight called again? <laughs> the, <laughs> it was, the Wellington, was it the Wellington straight? <laughs> down the Wellington straight into, uh, into that left and through Luffield, you see all the fans there. That's often where you get quite a bit of action. But I think I remember going on a test day here when F1 was driving and standing on the outside of Maggots and Beckett's and just seeing how quick the car's change of direction was, how quick the car was through there. I think for everybody here, you need to tick that off once to go and stand on that corner and just see the speed of these things. If you could make one change to the circuit, sorry, anyone here working at Silverstone, uh, what would it be and why? More grandstands. Well, that's, <laughs> George, that's a very diplomatic answer, isn't it? <laughs> very good, yeah, fair we enough. Need to make, Get more I mean, Silverstone's in. definitely top three of the biggest of the year, but we need to make it number one and by a long way, yes. so. Yeah, love that. Um, we're going to do some quick fire questions now for you, George. All right. Before we head to some of the questions that you guys have been asking uh, as well. George, your favorite track? Well, obviously, Silverstone. Apart from Silverstone. <laughs> <laughs> Apart from Silverstone, yes. um, Suzuka. Yeah, nice, nice. Go on, Kay. Well, they, they've asked me what two drivers would you go on a road trip with, <laughs> but I, I, I want to say which two do you not want to go on a road trip with? <laughs> <laughs> Phones away. <laughs> 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 I'm looking at the audience here. There's too many cameras, too. There's, I mean, to be honest, between the drivers, we generally all get along reasonably well because there's this sort of respect between each other. There's obviously only 20 of us in the world and we sort of know what we all go through, but there's definitely one or two that I wouldn't want to go on a road trip with. <laughs> but I'm not going to say names because... What? Okay, okay. Does, is Oscar Piastri as much of a school bully as he looks like? He looks like an American high school bully, right? <laughs> no. Is he nice? I, I really, he's a nice guy, he's I think. Really I'll bear it in mind now. It's the first I've heard of it, but I'll... Uh... So who would you go on a road trip with then? From the current drivers... Um... I don't really know, to be honest. It depends what, what you're after, really. Uh, what are you after? I don't really know what. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's gone off piece, hasn't it? Um, 
I mean, I would have said Danny Rick if he was still on the grid, but obviously... In spirit, he's there. Um, he counts. He yeah, yes, yeah. he, he counts. All right, we'll say Danny. And then... I might actually say Gasly, you know, because Gasly, he's... he's um, Ga Pierre's a super nice guy. He's somebody I get along with well, but it's somebody I don't really spend much, much time with, so... Uh, yeah, we'll have some bonding time, maybe. Julian is devastated you didn't even consider him. Oh, uh, look, I assumed I was actually out of the reckoning. <laughs> he could have made <laughs> Otherwise, I'd have been straight though. top of the list. <laughs> Me and George road tripping. Oh, uh, Julian, have you got questions for George? Uh, which team principal are you holidaying with? Which and team? you can't say Toto. <laughs> yeah, you can't, yeah. <laughs> Gunter Steiner, I reckon. Yeah. Oh, 100%. <laughs> Where would you take him? You'd climb I, one of those mountains with him. Yeah, probably. I, I was on a flight once and I sat down and Gunter came and sat right next to me and we spent this five-hour flight just chatting away and there was so much effing and blinding. <laughs> <laughs> it was like I'd watch a Netflix. Are you going to read his book, Surviving to Drive? Has he got a book? Yeah. Has he? I had no idea. He's got a book out. I may do. I may do. Well, yeah. If you sat next to him for five hours, probably doesn't need to now, right? <laughs> yeah, I know, but I've still got it. Uh, did you pass your driving test first time? No. <laughs> hey! The best drivers pass second. Yeah, I, I got Ooh. no minors but one major, but I'm sure that the instructor <laughs> had it against me because I'd, <laughs> I was in the, like, the wrong lane at a roundabout and she gave me a oh, major. That would do it. That would yeah, do it. <laughs> a major though? Really? That would do it. Okay, all right, all right. No, uh, it was a bit embarrassing. What's your favourite thing to cook? That's what we've got here. I don't <laughs> cook, to be honest. <laughs> Um, what would you order? What would you order in? My favourite sort of cheat meal, I love a good burger. That's sort of my go-to when I'm feeling a bit, a bit naughty. Um, pizzas, I love, love a good pizza. I actually have a pizza quite often on like a Saturday night before a race. Sort of a bit of carb load in. Yeah, it's a bit counterintuitive, but it's, um, it's like it's mental energy. You know, having a pizza makes me feel good. So uh, get a good <laughs> night's sleep and perform better the next day. In a similar vein to the road trip question, which driver would you want to be stranded on a desert island with and why? Oh. I think you've got to be strategic here because you need to survive. Yeah, I feel, I feel like Lewis would be pretty good at this. I feel like he's got a bit of experience of exploring. I mean, that guy's been everywhere, so... Um... Did he go to Antarctica this winter? Yeah, so he said. <laughs> <laughs> you think he photoshopped yeah, it? I don't know. I don't know. It's, yeah, it looked pretty cool, to be honest. So, um, who would You be... need to pick somebody that survived a lot of crashes. Because if they survived that, they're going to survive anything else. Yeah, maybe. maybe. Mick Schumacher or someone. <laughs> <laughs> I think we'll go to the next question. <laughs> Okay, moving along. Um, who would you not want to be stranded with? I mean, that's a pretty similar yeah. question. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, I mean... <laughs> no, Max is, Max is a good guy, to be fair to him. He's a good guy. Um, no, I, I can't say, I can't say. There's, there's one or two drivers who I definitely wouldn't want to be stranded with, but I, I don't want to say. I'm, I'm too nice for that, I'm too nice for that. Oh. One day, in the book, in the book, in years to come, okay. we'll, uh, we'll announce it. You heard it here first, we'll, we'll look out for that. In what year, what year are you writing a book? I have no idea. I didn't even know I was until 30 seconds ago. <laughs> you <laughs> just <laughs> committed to one. That's, um, that's going to be the book, it's just who I don't want to be stranded with on the <laughs> desert island. <laughs> um, if you weren't a Formula One driver, what would you be? What well, I mean, I done? always... So when I was younger, I was playing football when I was go-karting, I think... You know, I was lucky that my, my parents got me into some sports, so I probably would have pursued football in for a little bit. But to be honest, I love um, like the engineering side of, of Formula One. I'm doing a lot of things with, with the team and talking about the sustainability side of things and also with Petronas. I went to Kuala Lumpur recently and um, seeing what their future plans are with the biofuels and a number of things and projects they've, they've got ongoing on the sustainability front. Is, I find it really, really fascinating. So, yeah, probably some sort of engineering, maybe. Nice. What, what would you do after you... I mean, one day you're going to win world titles and whatever and you're going to hang it up. What, what, what's the one thing you want to do once you've finished driving? Not be on Sky Sports. <laughs> <laughs> 
you know what? That's like everyone's go-to answer, and then they end up on Sky Sports. <laughs> yeah, no, I take that back. I like the Sky Sports people. Because um, <laughs> I see the cameras are filming me. <laughs> I'm not too sure, to be honest. I mean, it's a long way away. Um, I guess no idea what I'll be, be up to in my life then, but it's... This lifestyle is such a fast lifestyle. You're on the road so much. You know, we're doing what we, what we love. You know, by the time I'm 40, I might be like Fernando and want to go for another 25 years or something. <laughs> um, or you just might want to chill out and live a slow lifestyle. I'm not too sure. We've got 10 minutes now for audience questions. These have been submitted in... Oh, sorry, hands down. These have actually been submitted in advance. I, I apologise. I should have put that first, shouldn't I? Um, so thank you so much for submitting so many brilliant ones. I think I'm going to actually steal some of them for the next race I'm at. This is from Zoe Carrington. Zoe, are you here? Hello, Zoe. Zoe, hi. Hello. Um, she asks, if Lewis retired... Who on the current grid would you want as your teammate? Ooh, that's a, that's a good question. Um... <laughs> to, to be honest, I really don't care. To be, I, think, <laughs> I think if you've been teammates with Lewis, then there's nobody who would be a faster, more challenging teammate than him. So, uh, anyone, anyone. To be honest, I'd probably want to be teammates with Max because you want to be, um, you want to push yourself and, you know, he's obviously the number one guy at the moment, so, and I'm back myself, so I'd want to go, I would want to go against Max. This question is from Nodge. I hope I'm saying that right. Nodge, are you here? Where's no? Nodge? No, is that right, Nodge? Yeah? Sorry? John? <laughs> <laughs> Why did you submit so many questions under the name of Nodge? Anyway, what's your opinion on DRS? Should the rules be changed to not have it involved as much? I think um, with the cars in its current state, it's, DRS is a necessity. I think it's, it's impossible to be able to have a proper good overtake without DRS. So I don't really know what the sport can do to have cars that don't have DRS, but I think... Even when I raced in Formula 4, Formula 3, you, you'll always have some sort of turbulent air. And if the slipstream isn't good enough, you've got no chance. So, I mean, I don't love DRS, but I think it, it definitely creates some excitement. Thank you, Nodge. Uh, Becky, <laughs> <laughs> Becky Mansell asks, do you have any lucky charms or superstitions on race day? Not really, no. I have a bit of a routine. I'd always have like a five minute power nap before the race just to sort of zone out a little bit, calm, calm down, and then, then go five, to a... Well, hang on, how long minutes? before well, the I race? Well, I don't what? have five minutes. I've, that's all I've got. So I've got to... You, get... you can fall asleep that quickly, though. No. That's I mean, called I... meditation. <laughs> okay, medi okay, I meditate <laughs> like for five minutes. Don't they sleep in bursts? I meditate for five minutes then. So I, I just close my eyes, relax, okay. get changed, and then make sure I go to the toilet. <laughs> <laughs> that is like every driver's answer to this question is go to the loo, understandably Do you visualise the first corner before every race? I do sometimes, I think um, if I'm on the front row or the front two rows I'd visualise it because there's probably less variables that can happen, if you're only low, further down than that, there's too much craziness so you just got to be intuitive and, and go for it but yeah, Australia, probably from the moment I qualified P2 it was like I know where I'm going at turn that one. And nice. Did I'm, you I'm... know you were going to send it down the inside of Max? <laughs> Whatever happens, so wherever good. he breaks, yeah. I'm going to go for it. Yeah, I was just going to break <laughs> oh, five metres after him and, and hope it stuck. Fortunately, it did. <laughs> um, Shao Freeman. Shao, are you here? Yeah, OK. Give us a wave, Shao. <laughs> Shao, hi. Oh, hello. Shay. Shay. Sorry, I, I, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Um, if you had the opportunity to race someone from the past, who would it be, and why is it Jolian Palmer? <laughs> <laughs> I might have added the last bit. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I like it. Um, I used to really enjoy watching Montoya race. Um, I like seeing his, his old videos. He was just a bit of a hooligan, I think. So uh, <laughs> maybe, yeah, I'd probably say, say Montoya. Natalie asks quite a deep question. Natalie Hannon, are you in here? Hello, this is Natalie. quite a deep question. What is the biggest regret from your motorsport career so far? Ooh. 
I know earlier you said you don't really regret yeah, anything and I mean, failure's been good, but... Probably crashing into Valtteri wasn't a highlight of my, <laughs> <laughs> of my I career. I predicted you might um, say that. <laughs> how, how awkward was it? And what point did you realise? Because obviously with that crash, there was a bit of who done it. Yeah. At what point were you like, <laughs> might have been me? <laughs> <laughs> well, I knew that from the beginning I crashed into him. I mean, that was pretty clear, but I think... I think that was probably one of the lessons I took away from that is for all of us in the, that race car, you have tunnel vision. You see things from one perspective. And I was probably very quick to jump to a conclusion without you know, hearing from others, seeing other videos, and letting you know, the emotions get the better of me. So as I said, I wish I didn't do that, but in other ways, I wish I did because the mistakes I maybe made following that crash, if I didn't make them then, I would have made them at another point in my future. So, um, yeah. Uh, Neil Stradling asks a great question. I really like this one. Hello, Neil. Hello. Um, he said, being a director of the Grand Prix Drivers Association, does it feel like you are herding squabbling cats at times? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, some of the drivers just... Um, chat on forever, so it's um, they've got so many views and opinions. I, I really enjoy it to be honest because we are quite united as drivers, and even when I wasn't a part of a GPDA, I was always sort of bringing my views forward. And I think if I can look back at the end of my career, obviously my driving is is my priority, and I want to win and I want to win championships. But if I could have contributed towards improving the sport or improving the safety helping, you know, grassroots, um, I guess I could look back with, with some pride. So I think that was the rationale be behind the, the GPDA. Well, who's nice. the chattiest in the meetings now? <laughs> I used to have Felipe Massa in mind. <laughs> yeah. And wow, he'd go on about the basics for a very long time. Yeah. We it's... all know the yellow flag rules now, mate. Yeah. <laughs> it's Carlos Sainz now. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, good. At least you got one name out of you, George. Yeah. Um, Tony Campbell. Tony Campbell. Yes. Hi, Tony. He asks, which historic F1 car would you most like to drive? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I think I'd like to drive the Mansell 92 car. Because I think... Um, well, I actually drove for one of the first times the... Um, the 2013 Mercedes F1 car today here at Silverstone, if any, anybody saw that. And that was a lot of fun. I mean, the V8 just sounds so much better than what we've, we've got now. Um, so we need to find a way to get back there because, yeah, it makes ours sound like hoovers. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but I think, but after, to be honest, after, after three laps, it just felt like another racing car. And you just got used to it. The noise, you kind of... Um, you didn't even really listen to, you're just so focused on, on driving fast. Whereas I think driving a car from the 90s or, or even earlier is just so different to what we experience now. I think that'd be a pretty cool experience. Have you driven some really old ones? 60s, None. 70s? I haven't driven, I haven't driven, driven any. So I need to, I need to find oh, the time. I did a Lotus 72 at Brands Hatch. I think it was a Fittipaldi era Lotus. Okay. They're being terrifying. Yeah, I And bet. these, they're really quick in a straight line. They're tiny, and your feet are right on the well, end of the car. we're big boys as well, so we're, uh, our feet are poking out the, the front yeah. of the nose. It's um, a lot of respect for those guys, but I'm quite happy with uh, the current <laughs> one cars, to be honest. <laughs> so Janet Hunter asks, do you watch any other motorsports, like MotoGP? And if so, what do you take from them that helps you in your own practice? I do try and watch as much um, motorsport as possible. I used to love watching MotoGP. I don't see as much of it these days. I don't know why that is. Formula E, I mean, yeah, I don't know. To be honest, on, on Formula E. I've got mixed feelings because they are quite entertaining racing. And the, the drivers, there's a high level of, of drivers there, but it's obviously just a little bit too too wacky sometimes. I'm always watching F2 and F3. Always interesting to see who, you know, the guys are up and coming. And they're also pretty, pretty interesting racing. But um, I'd always try and watch back the F1 races because I think when you're in that, that cockpit, you're so focused on everything that's going on with your car, your team, your own performance. And you sometimes miss things that probably everybody here in the room 
is, has seen because you know, you're all watching Sky Sports or Channel 4, whereas we're just so focused on our, our job, it's actually quite, quite handy to, to re-watch it sometimes. You re-watch re -watch the whole thing? Not straight after. I mean, I need a few more days. Uh, I'll, I'll put it on fast forward. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Wait until Mercedes comes on the screen. Yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> no, I just watch it in times two, so... Uh, <laughs> um, and finally, probably one of the most important questions of the day. Um, George, you may struggle with this one. Catherine's asked, Hi, what's your favourite kind of cheese? <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, that's a, it's <laughs> that is a tough one. <laughs> I had a whipped ricotta recently with a bit of honey, and it was lovely. And that really caught me by surprise. Um, I don't really know. I don't. I don't tend to like brie, to be honest. I don't like the smelly cheeses. Um, but good question. Good question. Yeah. That was unexpected. Yeah, we thought it was a good one to end on. Really? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we did. Clearly. Okay. Clearly not, but a great answer from you, George. Lots of great answers from you um, tonight and lots of great questions from you guys. So a huge thank you to Silverstone, to Underground Fan Club and to you out here for making tonight so, so special. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. They've been mega, a mega, mega crowd. Uh, and my biggest thanks goes to our panel here as well, to Kay Curd, to Julian Palmer. I gave you lots of stick, Jolian, thanks. And to the legend, Silverstone's very own, George Russell.